Good evening and welcome to Calvary Christian Fellowship's Wednesday Bible study on Revelation. We're so delighted to have you join us this evening. Our study, again, will continue on the foc with our focus on the book of Revelation. And if you have any questions about this uh, study or biblical prophecy, please put them in the comment section below and we will do our very best to answer them in our upcoming studies. Also, if you'd like to reach out to Calvary Christian Fellowship with any prayer requests or praise reports that you may have, please use the contact information on the screen to reach out to us. It means so much to hear from all of you who have uh, let us know of your prayer requests that we pray over daily. And we also do rejoice that the Lord has been answering prayer within our midst, and for He is good and faithful. And it does mean so much to see not only those of you who are watching us on Facebook, but also the comments and the liking and loving during these Bible studies and the encouragement that we're receiving. And uh, feel free to just type a hello to let us know that you're watching tonight. If you've missed one of our Bible studies, I want to encourage you to go to our YouTube channel. You can find us on all these social media platforms by looking for at CCF Fort Wayne. But on our YouTube, we have archived our sermons. And uh, feel free to watch this study and other messages as well. If you'd like to be a blessing to Calvary Christian Fellowship through your tithes or your offerings of support, you may mail in your donations to Calvary Christian Fellowship, P.O. Box, 25544 Fort Wayne, Indiana 46825 And finally we want to invite you to come and be with us in person this and every Sunday for our 10 a.m. Sunday morning service We meet at the Community Center downtown The address is 233 West Main Street but parking is found off of Berry Street for those of you who are familiar with downtown Fort Wayne Come and see us. We'd love to see you this and every Sunday at 10 a.m. Well, once again, we are so blessed to have our foreign missionary, uh, Nancy Honeytree, and she's going to be blessing us with a mini concert. God bless you, Honeytree. Bye. a fire I fought against your plans took my life into my hands I feared the full surrender you require unconditional surrender what am I fighting Conditional surrender. Jesus, you've won the fight. I gave up all my rights. You've won my life. All quiet on the front line as I amid the devastations of my pride you speak to me of peace as you raise me to my feet and you call me as a soul
tree. Amen. That song for me just so fits into what we're going to be studying tonight. Unconditional surrender or I see the Lord? Which one? Well, all of that, but the unconditional surrender. Because, and I know there might be some doctrinally that will disagree with me, but I don't believe there's anything that we have to do to get saved. Except believe in our heart and confess with our mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord. And in making that confession, we're confessing that we're sinners that need a Lord, a Savior. Mm -hmm. And in making the confession that we as sinners need a Savior, we know there's nothing that we can do to save ourselves. And so we surrender that way. But I, I believe there are a lot of us that get saved that have not surrendered a lot of things to the Lord. And after we're saved, we come to those places of surrendering or not surrendering those areas of our life to his lordship in our life. Would you agree with me on that, honey tree? You're kind of pondering that. And 
I, I absolutely do. I, do you? I mean, I think we are well and truly saved when we receive Christ yes. as our Savior. And we would, if we died, we would go to heaven and uh, we're a child of God. And that's a, a gift. Isn't it saying it's, doesn't it say in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8, that it's not by works? By grace we're saved. Um, through faith, not of works. It's a gift of God, so we gift. can't boast. However, I I know plenty of times in my life where I, I could see that I really wasn't walking in all of that Christ had purchased for me. I feel like he purchased, a, as I get to know him better, I feel like what I am understanding is that he purchased a whole salvation, a whole shalom Amen. of health and holiness and everything with his blood and with his suffering and with his resurrection. I mean, he gave everything to purchase this for us. And uh, I want to receive it all, you know, so I feel like I'm in that process of, of still receiving all of what Jesus paid for. And have there, have there been in, in either one of your lives times where there were things you didn't want to surrender to the Lord. Or I wanted to, but I couldn't. I couldn't figure out how. Figure out how? Yeah. That could be there too. Or in, in my life, there have been sometimes I didn't want to either. Mm -hmm. I, I didn't want to give this up. And the reason I'm going at all of those things is because they absolutely apply and why unconditional surrender to Lord, the Lord is so important. Because during the millennial reign of Christ, which we introduced a few studies ago, okay, and we really went a little more in depth last week when we were together, there's one particular verse, and this is all found in Revelation 20, which is where we're looking. This is all found in Revelation 20, and this is the verse that I want to sort of hone in on, if you will, for tonight's study. Verse 6 says, Blessed and holy is the one who has a part in the first resurrection. Over these, the second death has no power, but they will be priests of God and of Christ and will reign with him for a thousand years. Now, we're going to have to go into depth on that because that one verse has opened up a lot of things that have to really be explained and, and make sure that we have a good comprehension of as believers because if not, we'll get all confused. Um, I, want to, I want to go through a list, and if you're taking notes in our study, uh, several things about this thousand years that are going to be important to us that are going to lead up to that portion that we just read in verse 6, where it said that for a thousand years, we are going to be reigning as kings and priests with Jesus here on planet Earth. But before we now get into that, I hope I gave you a little teaser <laughs> about that and tying it into the, the song that Honey Tree ministered. I hope I can make the connection, okay? Okay. During this time, and I'm going to give some scriptures, Ben, if you'll be able to put them up for us. And I'm going to ask Pastor Andrew to take his Bible yes. telephone there, computer, and look up the verses for us, all right? Okay. And if you'll begin, look up Isaiah chapter 2, verses 1 and 3. And here's the first thing that's going to be happening during the millennial reign of Christ. During this thousand-year period, Israel is going to be a superpower on this planet. And okay. that's found for us in Isaiah Chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. Would you read them, son? The word that Isaiah, the son of Amos, saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. It shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the house of the Lord shall be established as the highest of the mountains and shall be lifted above, up above the hills and all the nations shall flow to it. And many people shall come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us his ways and that we may walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. 
Jesus Christ has returned. Uh -huh. We've already said in Revelation 19, Glory we've returned with him and he's going to have a literal headquarters in Israel, there in Jerusalem. All the nations are going to be coming to him and Israel is going to be the super power under the reign of Jesus Christ. Okay. Hallelujah. Now let's stay in Isaiah. Would you go to Isaiah chapter 11 verses six through nine? And let's take a look at just a little side point of interest and your sister and brother-in-law should be very happy if they're watching this Bible study. Isaiah 11, Isaiah six, 11 six verses through six through nine. The wolf shall dwell with the lamb and the leopard shall lie down with the young goat and the calf and the lion and the fattened calf together and a little child shall lead them. The cow and the bear shall graze, their young shall lie down together and the, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox. Now, there's a couple little points in that. I think I may have shared this a long time ago. I don't remember. But my, the first church that I pastored was up in Angola on our campgrounds that was there at Camp uh -huh. Calvary. And there was a precious man. He's with the Lord now, a man named Earl Farver. And he was a, a farmer. Farmer Farver, we used to call him. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> Brother Farver, when I had taught a little bit about this, came up to me and he said, do you understand what's going to happen when Jesus is reigning here on planet Earth? And I said, well, I, I'm not sure I do. He said, well, you have to be a farm boy to understand what's going to happen. Uh -huh. For a lion and a lamb to be able to graze together is going to require an internal digestive transformation for uh -huh. them because mm -hmm. their digestive systems are set up differently. And I said, well, I did not know that. And he said, well, now let me tell you what that means. He said, when Jesus becomes our king in our life and his kingdoms in our heart. He does an internal change so that we're able to get along with people that maybe were enemies oh, before. Oh, yes. You know, I really think that's so true that suddenly people that we thought were so weird, we now know what's, what's so good about them, you know. <laughs> like I, I felt that way about Christians when I got saved. That Before I got saved, it's like, they're so strange. And now, as after the Lord came into my life, I just realized, oh, I need these people. <laughs> now you're one of us. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Well, isn't that a wonderful lesson? It's beautiful. But the, the point that I wanted to bring out of this is something may be a little hard, Andrew, for you with your love of Coney Island here just a block away. Yes. And that is we're going to be vegans during this time. Wow. Because, what you know, you don't, you, if you're laying down with these animals and a child's leading them, you're not going to be killing them to eat them. Mm -hmm. All right. But so we're going to be vegetarians. That's just a little interesting side point that's going to happen. But I, I will say this. Um, I was on the phone this week with Brother Sonny Schrock that yes. we're rejoicing over what God's done in his life. Amen. And he was sharing with me that one of the great advantages that he had when he had this terrible fall off a eight foot ladder and I wasn't aware he fell head first oh. and broke his neck and shattered little bones in his ears. Mm -hmm. that it, it's been terrible. But you know what the doctor said to him? Because he was in such excellent shape, it's given him the, the added bonus to be able to get through yes. what he's done. And on the phone this week, he said to me, you know what? And I'm, I'm a vegetarian and it's done a lot to be able to help me in, in, in the strength that I've had. And, and he didn't say this to me, but I felt a little voice coming through saying, and Pano, maybe you need to cut back on those ribeye steaks. I'm not so sure. Mm. There's probably some real good health benefits mm -hmm. to, to these sure. things. So that's going to happen. Here's, here's the next one. We look, Pastor Andrew, and Isaiah, we'll just keep you there, okay. chapter 55, and look at verses 3 through 5. Because as Israel being a super power over all these vegans, <laughs> he's also going to have a very prominent regent that's going to be serving right directly under him that I get excited about when I read this. Yeah. Isaiah 55 verses 3 through 5. Incline your ear and come to me here that your soul may live and I will make with you an everlasting covenant my steadfast sure love for David. Ooh, the Lord says he's making a covenant clear back in the Old Testament he made it mm -hmm. with David when he was king. Let's go on. Behold I made made him a witness to the peoples, a leader and commander for the peoples. Behold, you shall call a nation that you do not know, 
and a nation that did not know you shall run to you because of the Lord your God and of the Holy One of Israel, for he has glorified you. David's going to be coming back. We'll explain that in just a minute. He's going to be coming back and he's going to be reigning with Christ God. on a throne with it. He, he promised that. He said, David, you're always going to be on the throne. Now, it's not going to be the throne that Jesus reigns, but he's going to be right there Amen. as a co-regent with Jesus, not as a co-regent, but with authority that has been given unto him to reign during this time. Let's look at Amos. Now, that's going to be a little harder oh. for you. It's next to the book of Andy. Okay. Yes. Amos <laughs> chapter 9. Uh-huh. And just read verse 15, if you will. 15. Amos 9. I will plant them on their land, and they shall never again be uprooted out of the land that I have given them, says the Lord your God. Israel's going to be a superpower, and listen to this, they're also going to be secure. They're no longer going to have to worry about the, the dome of protection from any bombs coming from, missiles coming from other dome. places, or any other attacks that are going to take place. Right. During this thousand-year period, they will be absolutely secure. Look in Zechariah chapter 13, and I'm going to give you a chunk to read, so Ben is going to need to be putting a lot of verses up. It's 1 through 9, Zechariah 13, 1 through 9. Some of you read those On parts? that day there shall be a fountain open for the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem to cleanse them from sin and uncleanliness. And on that day, declares the Lord of hosts, I will cut off the names of the idols from the land so that they shall be remembered no more. And also I will remove from the land the prophets in the spirit of uncleanliness. And if anyone again prophesies, his father and mother who bore him will say to him, You shall not live, for you speak lies in the name of the Lord. And his father and mother who bore him shall pierce him through when he prophesies. On that day, every prophet will be ashamed of his vision when he prophesies. He will not put on a hairy cloak in order to deceive, but he will say, I am no prophet, I am a worker of the soil, for a man sold me in my youth. And if one asks him, what are these wounds on your back? He shall say, the wounds I received in the house of my friends. Awake, O sword! Against my shepherd, against the man who stands next to me, declares the Lord of hosts. Strike the shepherd, and the sheep will be scattered. I will turn my hand against the little ones in the whole land, declares the Lord. Two-thirds shall be cut off and perish, and one-third shall be left alive. And I will put this third into the fire and refine them as one refined silver, and test them as gold is tested." They will call upon my name, and I will answer them. I will say, they are my people, and they will say, the Lord is my God. So we're, what, what this is all saying is a prophecy over the millennial reign of Christ while he's here, and there's going to be a period of a thousand years that there's absolute devotion to God. Now, it's really important we understand this. In the absolute devotion to God, there are going to be some that that's not in their heart. They'll be doing it outwardly in a form but not with an inward transformation. And how we know that is remember, Satan now has been bound up. When he gets released, he's going to be able to influence those people that were only doing lip service, hmm. okay? And there's going to be a great army of them that are going to rise up. Now, they're going to come from all the different nations. And that's why, if you look in Revelation 20, this gets to be a little confusing unless we understand prophecy clearly. In verse 8, when Satan is released from the prison, it says he comes out to deceive the nations which are in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather together all of them for war. Now, Gog and Magog are found in another place in Scripture. They're found back in the book of Ezekiel, chapter 38 and 39. It talks about a great battle called Gog and Magog where there is Meshach, Tubal, and Rosh, that all rise up with all these other nations that are listed there in Ezekiel 38, and they're going to come against Israel. That's a literal battle that takes place, I believe, either before the tribulation or in the first portion of the tribulation period. Remember we saw at the end of the first three and a half years, things all begin to turn around. That battle could very well take place as one of the battles during that period of time. What I'm trying to communicate is this, 
what's being said now by Gog and Magog is a spiritual application. It's not saying that's the battle that's going to happen at this time. It's saying just as all of the nations sent armies to contribute to that battle that took place, there's going to be all these nations that are going to have people, they're devoted to God outwardly, but they aren't inwardly, and all it takes is for Satan to be released, and he's going to be able to deceive them to raise up a rebellion. And if you'll take a look one last time with this superpower of Israel, with David sitting on the throne, these people that verse 8 says are numbered like the sand of the seashore. I don't know if Ben's able to put Revelation 20 verse 8 up there. He's got it. It says they came up on the broad, broad plain of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints and the beloved city, that's Jerusalem, and fire came down out of heaven and devoured them. Boom. Now it's over. All right. So there is a devotion to God and some of that portion may have been confusing but God's going to bring to judgment, okay, the ones now during the millennium that show, hey, without Satan, we still have a rebellious nature. Uh -huh. That's why it demanded Christ going to the cross. Look at the depths of our depravity mm -hmm. that Satan could rebel in eternity past and take a third of the angels with him. And after that judgment of Armageddon, and all of the wrath of God that's been poured out and a thousand years of Christ reigning, he can still influence people mm -hmm. that have had this great period of devotion to God and what it did to turn against him. Now, here's the next part. And just write it. Maybe you want to write it down. There will be temple worship. And we've talked about this before. Uh -huh. We're going to be here as Christians. But as Christians, we're going to be ruling as priests and as kings here on earth. And that we'll get to in just a moment. But in Ezekiel chapter 40 through Ezekiel chapter 48. And Andrew, if you'll get ready with Amos chapter 9 and verse 11. Those nine chapters, 40 through 48, they're going to describe the millennial temple and the worship that's going to take place during that thousand year reign in this temple. It will not be the temple that the Antichrist had built with the Jews. And then right when they're all excited about it, remember we saw in the mid of the tribulation, he's going to say, I'm God, you got to worship me. Uh -huh. Not that temple. There will be another temple that's going to be established that now the Jews are going to be able to go there and worship and they'll celebrate all the feasts. And we've shared this before, but just quickly, there are seven of the feasts. They will now be doing the seven feasts of Israel in the temple because they were commanded by God in the Old Testament that three times a year mm -hmm. they were all the males were to go to Jerusalem and they were to celebrate three in the spring, one in the late summer or late spring, early summer, and one, uh, three of them in the late fall. And those seven feasts of Israel are a picture of Christ. Mm -hmm. OK, so now just like we take communion and when we take communion, we remember the body of Christ that was broken for us and the blood of Christ that was shed for yeah. us. And it says as oft as we do that, we do it in remembrance of him till when? Till he comes. Till he comes. Now he comes. So what do the Jews do? Now the Jews who've accepted Christ, OK, and are worshiping him, they now, with those seven feasts that they didn't understand before, they're going to see Jesus like how we did with communion. They're going to look what you did for us. Uh -huh. You are that lamb. You are that first fruit. You are our Pentecost through the giving of the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. You're the one that sounded the trumpet and you're the one who returned and you're the one that brought rest. They're going to see all those things like we have never really understood them. Mm -hmm. OK, now all that temple worship will be taking place. What does it say in Amos 9 verse 11? In that day I will raise up the booth of David that is fallen and repair, repair its breaches and raise up its ruins and rebuild it as the days of old. I know that there in the book of Acts, you can read about it over in Acts chapter 15. It says the fulfillment of that prophecy. And I do believe and here I'm talking this way in front of honey tree who leads praise and worship and great song reader for the Lord. Yes. But I think she would agree with me on this one. 
David was the great songwriter. Yes. And he, he, he must have been something. You know, he was the one when he was preparing, he wasn't allowed to do it, but David was the one that got, was allowed to get everything organized for Solomon to build mm -hmm. that great seventh wonder of the world, you know, mm -hmm. the temple that Solomon built. And he was the one that got all the musicians trained mm -hmm. and all the instruments prepared and got everything all orchestrated. And, he, and there was a, a guy that wrote a lot of the Psalms named Asaph and he was in there and, and he, David ministered unto them and he got generals together. I love that. And, and he had the generals to be the ones that taught everybody how to praise and worship. And that was because there was instruction in the Old Testament that when they were gonna go to battle, Judah was always supposed to go first. And that means praise, that's what Judah means. Judah always should be what leads you into battle, okay? And so David got all that organized and now he's gonna be reigning with Christ here on earth when he, we already talked about that a little earlier. And there's going to be now that booth that David had. Now, a lot of people, um, they think that was the tabernacle that Moses had, but that isn't what David did. Remember when David brought the ark back? Yes. Okay. And when David brought the ark back, that the temple was in, the, the, the tabernacle, it was a mess. You know, it had been a long time ago. It had been stored up, moved around, everything. So David, when he brought the ark back, there, there wasn't a temple that was built yet. Mm -hmm. So he built a tent and he put the ark in it and he did something that was unheard of. You can read about it in Chronicles and in Samuel. It says that David went in and sat before the Lord. <laughs> well, there wasn't any place to sit except the mercy seat. David just went in and, and sat between the cherubim in the presence of the Lord. And God's glory filled it. And it says during the millennial reign, I don't believe it's the literal tent that David had, but David is going to be leading, and I think this is going to be what he's going to be doing is unto Christ. I believe there in Jerusalem, King David once again is going to have that booth of worship and praise rebuilt. There's going to be praise and worship like we have never experienced. Amen. Getting us ready to go to heaven for what that's going to be like when the new heaven and new earth are established here with God's presence reigning here and the hallelujah chorus going on for eternity. Oh, I'm, get, <laughs> I'm getting ahead of myself just talking, but there's going to be worship reestablished with David, I believe, being the worship leader, okay? And I've only got a few minutes left. The next thing I want you to look at is there's going to be saints being given responsibility of reigning with Christ. Mm -hmm. And that's why coming full circle back around to saying, Honey Tree, your song of unconditional surrender so spoke to me about what we're teaching. Because we know from what you said in God's word, we are saved by grace. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. And we've tried our best to always talk about salvation for any of those who don't know Christ. And it's as easy as ABC and simply ask Jesus to come to you as a sinner and believe he can be your savior and confess him as your Lord right now, believing in your heart that he will come into your life and save you from your sin and give you the hope of eternal life. That's as easy as ABC. But now I want to, I want to just speak to all of us who are believers, because you see, there are going to be different rewards that are given to us at another judgment. We jumped ahead last week and we looked at how there's going to be the great white throne judgment mm -hmm. where there's going to be the judgment of Satan. There's going to be the judgment of all the fallen angels and every unbeliever that's never accepted Christ. Those will all stand at that great white throne judgment. We as believers have appeared earlier when the rapture took place during the tribulation period at what was called the judgment seat of Christ. Second Corinthians chapter five says, we all must appear before the judgment seat of mm -hmm. Christ. Now, look at what it says about when Jesus returns with us, or excuse me, returns and we meet him in the air, 
Ben, would you put up Matthew chapter 16 and in verse 27. And remember, we said Jesus' return has got two portions to it. There's the visible return, but there's also the return where he's coming for us and we're going to meet him in the air in the rapture. Look at what it says in Matthew chapter 16 and verse 27. For the Son of Man is going to come in the glory of his Father with his angels and will then repay every man according to his deeds. When he comes and we meet him in the air, there will be the rewarding of the deeds that we have done here as believers. Mm -hmm. Now, that will be the work that we have done. I believe it will be the things that we have been willing to surrender to the Lord and turn over to his lordship. But there will also be some of us that will stand, that will have to hear the Lord say, there were places that you didn't surrender. There were things that you did not turn over to my lordship. And those rewards, and we're going to pick up there next week with a, a plethora of scripture that talk to us about this reward. Do you know that it says in Hebrews chapter 6, and it says in, 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 in uh, verse 9, I believe it is, Ben, will you put up there real quickly? See if I've got the right verse. Hebrews chapter 6 and verse 10. For God is not unjust so as to forget your work and the love which you have shown, uh, can't, read, no, can't read the screen, have shown toward his name in having ministered and in still ministering to the saints. Praise God. <laughs> There's going to be rewards for that mm -hmm. and, and those things we've done. Honey tree, um, I don't mean to make you feel self-conscious when I get ready to say in closing, but I really have thought about you and I thought about my father and you because something stands out very vividly on my mind. Uh, I talked earlier, I won't tell the story about being on the platform with John Lloyd and uh -huh. all the men when my dad was preaching one Sunday. But I remember being on the platform on Clinton Street at Calvary Temple years ago and the choir all came out, mm -hmm. all back then, all wearing their robes, all looking very generic because they all looked exactly mm -hmm. the same. And my dad looking up and seeing Honey Tree in the choir. And my dad, and these were the early, early days of Honey Tree's ministry. And dad saying, that's why God is using her yes. in a special way. Yes. And I, I didn't understand what he was saying. I looked and I, I, so he said, she's singing in the choir. She's not too good to be singing in the choir. That's right. And there were other people that at that time, I'm sure wanted to be, and I, and I don't mean to be sitting in judgment, but they didn't have that same dedication of ministering unto the saints, because singing in the choir, Bless people sitting out in the congregation and being in a numerable company of people up there all singing in the choir and just being a voice blending in, nobody knowing who she is. She's got a robe on like everybody else. I believe not only did that bless her here on the kingdom and think of the Sundays that she could be home enjoying a Sunday afternoon, but huh. to minister unto the saints has come and done yes. a little mini concerts with us for a year and a half now. That's right. Honey Tree, what a wonderful testimony you are of there's rewards that are there. And I know God's blessed you with rewards here, but there are going to be rewards awaiting us hmm. for yes. what we've done. And Amen. the Lord is going to open up books that we're going to take a mm -hmm. look at. He's kept records of things. You know that there's one book that he's got that he opens up and it's a record just of this. It's a record of what we've done in speaking to one another, words of encouragement. Oh, that's a fantastic book, yeah. He, he's, he's, kept, he's got a book that he's, he, every time we've done that, he's kept a record and mm -hmm. he's going to open those up. And based on what we have used our mouth to do, what we've used our talents to mm -hmm. do, what we've been willing to surrender unconditionally yeah. to the Lord. The Lord says now, well done, good and faithful servant. Praise the Lord. <laughs> 
You ruled over those little things. Mm -hmm. Now I'm going to let you rule as kings and priests. And we'll pick right up there without any reviewing, no introductions next week. Lord willing. And all the people said amen. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Pastor Phil. Thank you, Honey Tree. Thank you, Ben and David. And thank all of you for joining us tonight. Uh, we hope that you've been ministered to by this Bible study. And once again, Calvary Christian Fellowship wants to invite you to worship with us for our in-person 10 a.m. Sunday morning service at the Community Center in downtown Fort Wayne. The address is 233 West Main Street. And just a reminder, the parking is found off of Berry Street. And if you want to be a blessing to Calvary Christian Fellowship with your tithes or offerings of support, you may mail them to Calvary Christian Fellowship, P.O. Box 25544, Fort Wayne, Indiana, 46825. God bless you and we hope to see you soon.